Uh, it's 10 a.m., so uh, welcome back from the break, everyone. Uh, this is the uh, last uh, last session of the of this virtual conference uh, on uh, non-ergodic quantum dynamics. Um, so, just a quick reminder that uh, all of the talks are going to be 30 minutes plus uh, 15 for questions. So, I will uh, give the speakers a five-minute warning uh, when uh, the end of their their 30 minutes is coming up. Uh, and, uh, you know, also there will be breakout rooms following the second talk, just like we've had for all of the, uh, all of the previous speakers. And the way that it's going to work is that, uh, you know, the first speaker joins room one, breakout room one, which is going to, you know, the option will come up and speaker two will join, uh, room two and people can continue their informal discussions with the speakers in that venue. So, uh, I guess uh, it's now, now we can get started. So our first speaker is Zlatko Popic, who's going to talk about quantum antibody scars. All right. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks for this opportunity to tell you about quantum antibody scars. So actually, I was supposed to be at KTP uh, during this time, but, um, well, here we are for a different program, I mean. Um, and apologies in advance for any issues with my Wi-Fi um, or any noise you might hear because I'm at home now. Um, so what I wanted to do was to just give you a kind of um, the big picture about what this topic is, because um, I don't think there have been any other talks on this. So I thought I would just, you know, start from a very broad introduction, and then we can take it to, um, you know, more specific questions in the discussion afterwards. Um, so quantum antibody scars is basically illustrated by this picture we are looking at on this front slide. So what's this? So this is a Hilbert space of some um, complex quantum antibody system where each of these light bulbs is a node in the Hilbert space. So maybe some kind of spin system. And so each point is a product state, classical state of spins. And so the nodes are connected if there is a Hamiltonian um, matrix element between them. And so what we're interested in is the problem of quantum lock on this type of graph. So, for example, we start in some vertex, this one, and then, you know, the, the wave function spreads through this uh, Hilbert space and the coloring denotes the, you know, the weight of the wave function on a particular node. And as you see, if we start from the right hand side, um, there's going to be a spreading of this uh, wave function through this graph as it moves along. Then, of course, it reaches the opposite end. And and surprisingly, if you follow this long enough, you see that it's going to come back to where it originally started from. So this was, uh, you know, this was the surprise here um, and uh, why many people are interested in this thing, because this could be some very complicated, you know, quantum anybody system, um, which is non-integrable, so it should be thermalizing. And yet the wave function somehow manages to find its way back um, through this uh, Hilbert space, even after very long times. So the beginnings of uh, this phenomenon um, can be traced um, to this uh, old experiments um, in acoustics, uh, which were done by Chladni in the beginning, of, the beginning of 19th century, where he, you know, he took like a rectangular plate, as you see here, sprinkled some sand on top of it, and then the plane was uh, vibrating uh, according, you know, um, at some frequency. And there are various kinds of beautiful shapes that form on this plate um, as it vibrates. So this was the beginnings of uh, modern acoustics. And the connection with scars comes when we go, um, when we take flash forward to um, the end of the uh, 20th century, well, the 1980s, where people like Eric Heller um, asked the question, what happens if you take a domain, which is not necessarily rectangular, but some kind of stadium type billiard, and now you put a quantum mechanical particle inside of the billiard. So what Eric Keller found initially uh, numerically, when he looked at the wave functions of that particle inside the billiard, he found that they had this kind of strange concentration. So this is the probability density of uh, one of these wave functions. And he saw that they had this strange concentration in certain parts of the billiard, but not in other parts. And he could understand that concentration in terms of um, these unstable classical periodic orbits, which are known to exist in this uh, type of billiard. 
So these states were relatively rare in the sense that they formed like, um, you know, zero fraction of all possible states. So you might ask yourself, well, okay, why is this, you know, is this relevant for anything or is it just some kind of mathematical curiosity? And people realized soon afterwards that actually it does have a lot of, um, you know, important physical implications in the sense that people have observed signatures of these kinds of states um, you know, in various types of systems ranging from optical cavities, you know, to solid state heterostructure and uh, many other types of systems. So, um, this is the phenomenon that uh, Heller called scarring in the sense that um, the wave function of this particle in this uh, state in billiard is scarred by this um, classical periodic orbit. So, this anomalous concentration of the wave function um, is what he called scarring. Um, of course, uh, since, you know, initially that observation was numerical, but then people have also made some mathematical progress on, you know, rigorously demonstrating the existence of, um, of this effect. And that's something that's going to be important for, for this talk later on. And the way these mathematical proofs of scarring proceeded was um, using the following idea of quasi-modes. So if you look at this type of billiard, uh, there are certain states like this type of standing wave. So it construct a standing wave in this direction, and then some kind of envelope function in the other direction. So this is a very simple type of wave function, which is not an iron state of this, you know, complicated stadium problem. But it turns out that it has high overlap with actual eigenstates. And so because there's a small number of eigenstates which have high overlap with this particular quasi mode, you can then argue that these eigenstates inherit this uh, special property of these quasi-modes. And you will see that this will become later on when we talk about um, many body scarring. So the purpose, you know, of this talk is to ask the question, does this, you know, phenomenon of quantum scarring has any kind of analog when we talk about quantum many body system? Okay, so not single particle in, um, you know, some kind of stadium billiard or something like this, but truly a many body interacting quantum system. Okay, so that's the outline for my talk. So I'll give you a bit of a motivation for this. Um, then I will discuss a specific model where we believe that um, this many body based current physics um, takes place. And then I will move on to the, you know, details of that model and why, you know, we believe that, you know, there are many body scars in it. And then in the last part, I would like to give you a kind of a bit broader picture, you know, try to identify what are the mechanisms that give rise to this uh, phenomenon and what are some other examples uh, that we can think of. All right. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to work with questions. I cannot really see the questions, but um, somebody will let me know if there are any questions at any point. Yeah, so uh, I, afterwards we'll, we'll handle the the okay, questions great. using the chat box and so on. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. So let me get started then. So what's the motivation? The motivation is um, these recent experiments on many body dynamics in quantum simulators. Uh, in particular, this experiment that I'm sure many of you have heard of about um, probing many body dynamics in a 5100 Bergantin quantum simulator. So um, this interesting experiment um, used the system of Rydberg atoms, and they've developed a certain technology which allows to manipulate these Rydberg atoms and basically assemble them into long chains. So using these optical tweezers, as you see here, they were able to prepare a very long chain of 51 of these uh, Rydberg atoms. Of course, there were lots of previous experiments on uh, similar types of systems where people managed to construct, you know, smaller chains. Um, and uh, in a kind of stronger Rydberg blockade, as I will explain in a minute. But uh, how do we think about this system? So um, it's convenient to think about this as a chain of coupled two-level systems. So each of these atoms can be either in the you know, ground state or in a specific excited state called the Rydberg state. And um, so an effective Hamiltonian describing the collection of these atoms uh, can be written like this. So we have some single body terms. So the first term is just the Rabi term, which is flipping these atoms from the ground state into the Rydberg state and vice versa. So that's the Rabi frequency term. 
uh, X is just the poly sigma X matrix acting on this local uh, two-level system. Then there's a detuning term, which is simply like a you know, local density type term, um, which depends on whether an atom is in the ground state or the excited state. So um, the notation we're going to use is this uh, um, open circle is atom in the ground state, and then uh, Ni is zero, and if uh, it's in the Rydberg state, Ni is one. Okay, so that defines the second term. And then, of course, because these are the atoms, they also have uh, Van der Waals interactions between them, which is the last term. So those are the, you know, uh, power log gang interactions, as you see here. If the atoms are, you know, uh, both in uh, Rydberg states, okay? So that's the effect of Hamiltonian that describes this chain of, of these Rydberg atoms. And so one uh, thing that they demonstrated in this experiment was the ability to tune essentially all of these parameters. So for example, if you play with this uh, detuning relative to the Rabi frequency, so if you crank that up, you can prepare various kinds of crystalline states, these ordered phases, in particular this Z2 crystal state. So after they demonstrated this, the next thing they wanted to do is to probe some out of equilibrium dynamics when you start from this um, crystalline state. So what they did specifically was to quench the system from this Z2 state uh, by completely turning off um, this detuning uh, parameter in the Hamiltonian. But the system is still in this cyber bouquet. So the Van der Waals interactions are still very strong. And in particular, they're the strongest between, you know, nearest neighbor uh, atoms excited in the red state. So what they did was, uh, you know, they measured the density of the main walls, which are created in the Z2 state as a function of time. So the Z2 state is no longer, you know, it's not an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian. In fact, it's a highly excited um, state. Um, you know, it's supported over many eigenstates in the spectrum. And they were expecting that, you know, there would be you know, fast equilibration uh, to some kind of uh, steady value. And instead, what they found was that the number of domain walls was kind of oscillating as, as time went on. And they found this surprising for several reasons, as explained here. So the first reason why this was surprising, as I said, was that this initial state, the Z2 crystal, um, was kind of like an infinite temperature ensemble. So it was, you know, uh, very, very far from equilibrium, okay? Um, the other reason why this was observation was surprising is because the system was not obviously integrable or have any kind of conservation laws other than, you know, total energy and things like this. So it didn't seem that integrability was relevant for this. And of course, uh, the phenomenon also seemed relatively robust. So they noted that these oscillations, they seem to persist you know, well beyond some time scales that you could estimate from, you know, the Rabi frequency or this uh, Van der Waals um, blockade. So, so they, 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 this was a surprise uh, brought about by this experiment. And, you know, simply put, it's, you know, it's, an, it's a surprise that in a sense that, you know, just like this ice cream, right? It, you have a complex system, which seems to completely melt away but then it decides to reassemble back into its original state, okay? So, you know, with sufficiently complex, you know, non-integral quantum system, this should not happen. And the question was, what causes these apparently coherent oscillations in a system which should be thermalizing, okay? So this is, you know, the puzzle um, that was presented to us um, by this experiment. Now, Let's see how we can model this and how we can try to, you know, explore this system numerically, for example, in simulations. So the simplest model that we can build for this is um, if we work in the limit where this uh, Rydberg bouquet is much stronger than either the Rabi frequency or this uh, detuning. And that's an interesting limit because in that case, um, the Hilbert space is no longer a tensor product of two-level systems, okay? Uh, and the reason for that is because if you have stronger in um it's extremely costly energetically to excite 
nearest neighbor rebel atoms. Okay, so if you have both of these uh, nearest neighbors uh, excited into the rebel state, essentially it's going to cost you an infinite amount of energy. So what we want is to take out all these states from the Hilbert space. And as a consequence, you know, that will change the structure, the connectivity of this Hilbert space, and it will no longer be a Hilbert space of, you know, simple spin half systems or qubits, but something else. And what becomes of it is um, what's known as the Fibonacci chain in the sense that um, the dimensionality of that Hilbert space grows as a Fibonacci number. Um, so asymptotically, if you have a chain of atoms of size L, so L atoms, the dimensionality of that Hilbert space grows as a golden ratio to power L. So you see clearly that um, this is different from two to the L, which you should have for, you know, coupled uh, two level systems. And instead, it, of course, it grows slower, slower than that, because the gold ratio is 1.6 something. So that's because you took out uh, lots of these states, which violate the Rydberg constraints. Now, what happens with, uh, you know, the Hamiltonian in this limit? It becomes uh, actually really simple in the sense that it's just this uh, rabbi, rabbi flipping term but it has to be dressed by these projectors onto the ground state of these neighboring atoms. So a projector is just defined uh, like this. It's a projector on the uh, local ground state. And X, as I defined before, was just a poly matrix, right? So that's some kind of spin um, Hamiltonian. Um, and so the interpretation of this Hamiltonian is that it allows you to locally flip a spin or excite a Rydberg atom as long as both of its neighbors are in the ground state. So if you are in a state like that, that one, you can, uh, you can make a flip of the middle one because the neighbors are both in the ground state. But if one of them were not, then you, this kind of flip would be frozen and you couldn't do it. So this is what we call the PXP model now um, for obvious reasons. And um, as you see, it's a kind of really interesting, very, very simple model, right? Super simple to write down. So, you know, can one solve this model? Because if you just forget about these P operators, that's just a simple power magnet, right? So that's one of the simplest Hamiltonians you can think of. Unfortunately, when you dress it with these projectors, um, it completely changes, you know, the nature of the model in the sense that it becomes chaotic. So, um, this is uh, an example of the energy level statistics, which we checked by just numerically diagonalizing this Hamiltonian on a computer. And we calculate the distribution of the energy level spacing in the spectrum. And you see this is the, you know, numerically obtained uh, distribution and in sufficiently big systems, it seems to approach the Wigner Dyson distribution. So the model is chaotic and, uh, you know, it's a bit foolish to hope that you can just sit down and solve this model. Okay, so what do you do? So let's, the first thing we tried, of course, is to see whether we can reproduce some of this experimental phenomenology. And the first thing we did was to try and simulate the quench experiment, just to make sure that, you know, we are numerically reproducing whatever experiments uh, observed in the lab. So of course, on a computer, we could just simulate the quench starting from the Z2 crystal state. We do time evolution. We assume that it's a closed system. And then we measure the state after time t, and we can calculate, for example, the return probability as shown here, just the overlap with the initial state after some time. And we see precisely the, you know, the picture that I told you about that I tried to summarize on my first slide. We see that this entire many body wave function comes back to itself, to a significant fraction of itself, you know, repeatedly as time goes on. Okay. And this result already is quite interesting, quite non-trivial, because we're talking about the Hilbert space, which has, a, you know, 70,000 states when you remove all the, you know, simple symmetries. So it definitely shouldn't reach, you know, something like 70% of its original value, but it should be much, much more suppressed than that. So this was a big surprise to us. And also whatever else you measure, you know, whether it's entanglement entropy, correlation functions, local observables, all of these things, they, you know, they seem to come back 
to the original value after essentially the same time, okay? So we do seem to reproduce um, in these very simple numerical experiments what, you know, the real experiments in the lab we were seeing. So now how do we make sense of this? Um, and, um, you know, can we, can we explain and rationalize this behavior somehow? So that, that moves me to the next part, which is um, to try and make sense of, of all this phenomenology that we saw in the numerics and, of course, also in real experiments. And now I want to argue that there's a connection between this behavior and, uh, you know, Come the scarring on. behavior. Demba. Come on. Get up. Come on. Um, that's not coming from me. Um, okay. Can you please um, mute yourselves if you're not the speaker? All right. So I think we can go on. So, um, yeah. So, so I've shown you a little bit of phenomenology of this scarring. Now, why do we call it scarring? So I want to present some evidence uh, to hopefully convince you that um, this is a many-body analog of the you know, single particle scarring phenomenon. So the key to this was to go from dynamics to the eigenstates, okay? So, and the reason um, how, we, I mean, how we can do this is basically, um, if we analyze this return probability of the wave function, um, we can think of this conveniently by going into the energy eigenbasis. So if we insert the resolution of the identity here, this return amplitude is just, you know, the sum over all the energy eigenstates and then some phase factor that depends on the energies of these eigenstates and times the overlap of these eigenstates with the initial state. Okay, so that's a simple, you know, mathematical expression for this return amplitude. So what we're going to do here is essentially to take a Fourier transform of this dynamical plot that we have here. And by Fourier transform, I mean we're just going to plot the energy of all the eigenstates versus the overlap of these eigenstates with the initial state. Okay? So that's all the information that goes into this fidelity is contained in that, you know, in these energies and in these overlaps. And so that's what we see here. So those are the energies of all the eigenstates and those are the overlaps that I talked about on the log scale. So each dot here is one eigenstate. And as you see, this plot is, you know, very striking. It looks uh, something that's not quite like what you expect in a chaotic system, especially because there's a lot of structure here, uh, which, which you don't expect in a simple thermalizing system. And so several things are important here. So the first one is that there's a band of these special eigenstates, uh, the shaded ones, and those are selected by having anomalously high overlap with this uh, Z2 crystal state or the nail state. Okay, so especially these ones, they have very high overlap with the Z2 state. Um, the other thing which is important is that these special eigenstates are approximately equidistant in energy. So if you look at this gap here, it's roughly the same as this gap and roughly the same as this one and so on. And this is, of course, uh, one of the reasons why you can get oscillations in this kind of system, even though you have a huge number of states, because first of all, there's only a few states that have high support on your initial state. And these eigenstates, they have, you know, roughly, they're separated by roughly equal amount of, you know, equal separation in energy. So there's essentially a single frequency um, in the dynamics. But that's not the only thing which is special here, because if you look at this, there's lots of other states or lots of other eigenstates in the system, which are also kind of clustering around the same type of energies um, that are defined by these top states. So there's this kind of towering structure which emerges throughout the whole spectrum, even very deep in the bulk of this system. So this is then what we wanted to understand. So what are these special eigenstates? states, right? How do we construct them or how do we, you know, explain them? So that was, uh, that was the question which we need to answer in order to understand the special dynamics of this kind of system. So the key to understanding these special eigenstates um, is, um, again, to build these quasi-modes, right? 
So we are trying to build some kind of simplified states, which are perhaps not the actual eigenstates of this problem, but they are, you know, really, really close to the actual eigenstates. And so the actual eigenstates are then going to inherit the property, the special properties of these quasi modes in the same sense that they do in the stadium billiard, for example. And so the way we constructed these quasi modes is inspired by a simple free paramagnet, which in this graph picture we can view as a one dimensional hypercube. So if you just have three spins, um, you have these uh, classical states of spins, right? Up, down, up, down, and so on. And they're organized in a hypercube, right? So um, you can define, you know, the usual spin raising and lowering operators. So if you start from a fully polarized state, acting with S plus or S minus moves you in this uh, hypercube left or right. So that's the standard uh, simple uh, free paramagnet. It's so like we have about five minutes. Oh, really? Only five minutes? I thought I had uh, yeah, I mean, well, so this can be 15 minutes for discussion. So any, I mean, you can go a little bit beyond, but but the, the idea is to have questions for about 15 minutes, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll take a little bit more and then. Uh, okay. I think some of the things I mentioned will probably be useful for discussion in the last part. So, okay, so so this is the free paramagnet, okay? So the free X operator is just a sum of raising and lowering operators. So how do we construct the quasi modes for the PXP problem? Um, so, so we can similarly define some raising and lowering operators, but the problem is that um, now the system is not a free paramagnet, so it's not a hypercube. It's something which is called a partial cube. So it's a hypercube where some of the vertices have been removed, and those are the ones that violate the render constraint. Okay, so, um, so this is the graph for the PXP model um, for six atoms. And as you see, it's not a cube, but it has some nice structure. And we can decompose the PXP Hamiltonian in a kind of raising and lowering operator, which moves you in, in this graph left or right, okay? And so using these operators, what you can manage to do is to basically squash this complicated partial cube into a one-dimensional tight binding chain. And the way you do that is you start from this extremal vertex, which is your Z2 crystal state, and then you just build the basis acting many times with this H plus operator. And I'm not giving you the details of what that operator is, but it's something which is related to your Hamiltonian, okay? So you can build this basis, and that's like an effective 1D tight binding chain. And when you project your Hamiltonian into that basis, you get these quasi-modes approximations. And so just let me show you the final result of that. So this is the crosses are now the results of these quasi modes that we constructed in this um, tight binding picture. And as you see, they have extremely good overlap compared to the actual line states, which are these dots here. So these quasi modes, you know, they, they're strongly uh, atypical quantum states. And that atypicality is inherited by, you know, first of all, these top states in these towers, and then also the rest of the towers, which seem to cluster around the same type of energies. So these quasi-modes, they, they leave this imprint on eigenstates, and that's you know, one of the reasons why we call this scarring. The other reason why we call it scarring is because um, it has a very interesting uh, semi-classical limit. And um, again, we can understand that a little bit from, the, from this uh, graph picture in the sense that when we start from a free paramagnet, we can go to, um, uh, when we apply the Rydberg constraint, we go to this partial cube, which is the PXP model. And that partial cube, actually inside of it, there are two smaller hypercubes. So if you look at this graph, there are these two smaller hypercubes, which are exactly half of the dimension of the original one. So the free paramagnet was invariant under any permutation of you know, lattice sites whereas the PXP model is approximately invariant under permutation on either the odd or even sublattice. So there's this kind of uh, uh, sublattice permutation symmetry, if you like. And so how is this interesting? It's interesting because it gives you a way to approach the semi-classical limit of the system. And so the way that, that was actually done first was to um, basically uh, use this idea of uh, matrix product states. So you build a, a manifold, uh, which 
is a manifold of all matrix product states with bond dimension two, uh, which are compatible with this uh, Rydberg brocade. Okay, and so because these are you know um, only bond dimension two matrix product states, they capture you know very very weakly entangled um, uh, dynamics if you project the Hamiltonian into that manifold. And technically, the way you do that is by imposing the you know time dependent variational principle, which was first done in this paper. So the way uh, you get the semi-classical limit out of this is by, you know, you're parameterizing this MPS matrices in terms of some um, variables, which are like the angles. So each spin is given an angle uh, on which it can point on the block sphere. And if we are interested in the Z2 state, two, only two of these angles are relevant, one for the even sides and the other for odd sides. So these angles then become classical variables in this in this approach, and you get some effective you know classical um, uh, dynamical system, which you can integrate. And when you look at the dynamics of these angles, you see that there is a periodic trajectory in that phase space, and that's precisely the same periodic trajectory which is related to the uh, PXP model and and this uh, graph picture that we have here. So because I'm running out of time, I'm happy to discuss the details of this uh, later on, but uh, I guess I should um, try to finish um, as quickly as I can. And um, so let me just illustrate very roughly what I wanted to tell you um, as a kind of general outlook of all this. So I wanted to mention that um, there are many uh, different um, mechanisms that exist now of this uh, many body scarring. Um, and uh, the, the picture that we have in this uh, PXP model is just rep one particular representative of, you know, a much more general thing, which um, we call the spectrum generating algebra nowadays. Well, not nowadays, I mean, that's a very old concept, but now it's been kind of uh, uh, found in a lot of uh, condensed, interesting condensed matter systems, as you see here. And so that spectrum generating algebra is basically, you know, concerns the existence of some operator Q dagger, which when commutes, when you commute it with your Hamiltonian, you get back the same operator times some energy scale. And so this operator is very useful because it allows you to, con to construct a subspace um, of these eigenstates that are obtained by Q dagger acting in some eigenstate, let's say psi zero, the ground state of your system. And they, these eigenstates, they form a subspace which is going to be completely decoupled from, you know, the rest of your system uh, due to this algebra. So there's this subspace, which is generated by this operator Q dagger. And there are many models where this can be actually rigorously shown to happen, in particular the AKLT model and various other types of models. And PXP can also be reformulated in this framework, except that this algebra is not exact, but rather approximate. So that's one example that we have of this scarring. The fact that there is this special subspace which emerges in the PXP model, and I'm happy to give you more details how this uh, can be shown. Um, then there are also two other types of examples. One, which is this idea of uh, Krilov restricted thermalization, which is a slightly different origin for a subspace where there isn't necessarily, you know, an, an operator that you can figure out that satisfies this kind of commutation relation. But, you know, the Hamiltonian itself can form a, you know, a closed subspace if you start from some, let's say, state in the Hilbert space, and you just act with the Hamiltonian many, many times. So then you get the subspace, which is kind of like a tridiagonal matrix in that basis of these um, powers of A checking on the initial state. And that's also a subspace which is completely decoupled from the rest, but it's not completely you know, necessarily the same as this one. So that's a slightly different mechanism. And this is something that happens very often in, uh, in uh, fracton-like models where you have certain um, symmetries which facilitate the, you know, existence of such a subspace. And then there are even completely more general types of, uh, you know, uh, constructions where you can essentially embed an arbitrary set of, eigen, of, of eigenstates into a spectrum of some, you know, thermalizing Hamiltonian, and they may not necessarily have any, you know, special structure or any special dynamics, but you can still get, you know, um, this kind of decoupled subspace, which in the sense violates, um, in, violates, you know, um, full thermalization of this Hamiltonian. 
Okay, so it's time for me to wrap up. So, um, so here's the, you know, where we are in quantum antibody scars. So what I told you about in the PXP model was this nice connection that we have, you know, on the one hand, we have this periodic dynamics, revivals, and so on, um, interesting semi-classical limit, and so on. And that has a direct connection with the special properties of eigenstates of that model, okay? So that's, you know, what, what to me at least is a prime example of many body scarring. But as you see here, um, in recent works, there's a whole, a lot of other systems where some aspects of that kind of phenomena has been discovered. So for example, um, you know, this um, uh, spectrum generating algebras, as you see here and, uh, and here, they have been found in various other types of uh, physical systems. So these systems may have these special eigenstates which violate thermalization and so on, but it's not yet fully clear in all of these examples, for example, if they have this nice semi-classical limit and, um, and, you know, whether there's a connection between semi-classical dynamics and these eigenstates. Um, so these are the various kinds of examples where people have seen at least some aspects of this quantum antibody scarring. And these are, you know, some interesting uh, directions for future work. Um, so, for example, thinking about, you know, deeper connections between graph theory and many body physics, thinking about, you know, quantum KAM um, in light of this uh, matrix product state approaches. And then, of course, if we can use uh, this kind of uh, systems to do some interesting, you know, um, quantum technology applications. Um, using the coherence that they have in certain forms. And okay, I think I have run out of time. So these are my conclusions. Um, so basically what I wanted to tell you about is just, you know, this new class of non-integrable many-body systems, which have these atypical non-thermal eigenstates, and they also have this quantum revivals. And, um, you know, there's an, there are various analogies between this phenomenon and the old single particle quantum scarring, and I hope I've convinced you that um, it's reasonable to call them that. Um, there are many open questions that remain, and I'm happy to discuss these things. Um, and just before I finish, I wanted to say it's been really great to work, you know, in this area, um, because, you know, not only because so many people got interested in it, but especially because so many young people um, um, work in this area, and they, they've done really amazing work, and especially um, Chris Turner and Alex Michaelidis, they were the ones who um, really did all the heavy lifting on our first paper on this, and um, um, anyway, I, I would like to thank them as well as all the other collaborators that you see here. All right, so I think I'm going to stop here. Sorry for running the bit. All right. Over time. Yeah, thanks, Latko. Um, so yeah, if you have a question, you're welcome to uh, Either uh, well, you're welcome to either raise your hand or type it into the chat box, and I can read it. Um, we don't have uh, you know as much time for questions, but we we can uh, definitely move uh, any questions we're not able to get to in this time into the breakout rooms uh, after our second talk. Um, so I can I can um, start us off. So I was wondering um, what your take is on uh, the existence of these these sort of sub. Uh, sub-primary states, if you want to call them that, in this uh, overlap spectrum. So when you take this Z2 state and you project all eigenstates onto that state, you, have, you do have these towers. And I was wondering if there is kind of a systematic way of trying to obtain uh, the other the other eigenstates or, yeah, in those towers uh, in your kind of forward scattering approach. Yeah, I mean, this is a good question. And this is something we've thought about for a long time, but the short answer is no. I mean, you know, you can try starting from, you know, these states that we construct really well and then trying to make some, you know, create some kind of like a spin wave type excitation on top of these ones uh, to try and move you to the secondary, you know, states. But uh, none of that in the end seemed to be very quantitatively successful. So that's still a big question how we can really understand fully the structure in these towers. Okay. We have, uh, I want to add to that. So one thing sure. that I didn't have so much time to talk about is this idea here. So this, um, in this approach, um, 
we we have a slightly better way of building these quasi modes, which is based on this um, approximate permutation on even and odd sublattices. And in this approach, we actually get not only the you know the these top states, we also get a lot of other candidate states below. Um, whether that can help, I mean, the, it's very hard to assess the accuracy of that because it's hard to individually identify some of these lower states. They're not so nicely separated. And so we don't know whether we are really capturing accurately or not those states, but we have, you know, that, that method in this paper perhaps could say something about those states. Okay, great. And so we have a question. Well, I'm, I'm going to try to get to the questions roughly in the order that I'm seeing them. But uh, David Hughes has a question in the chat box about quantum KM. So David, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zlatko, I don't, you know, I just wanted to know what uh, what you had in mind there. Um, you know, what would so a quantum KM be? Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what I was just going to say is that uh, perhaps this uh, MPS approach that, uh, like, what these people have done here could be a kind of useful language to, you know, generally investigate, you know, the, the semi-classical limit of these uh, many-body systems where, you know, which might not have an obvious, you know, large N or something like this. Um, so just, you know, starting with this TDDP and then constraining it to a manifold matrix product states with a low bond dimension. Um, so and this is something that... Sort of a classical KM yes, yes. analysis on that. Yes. yes, and then, yes, and then project it. So basically projecting it, obtaining this kind of classical dynamical system and then seeing to what extent, you know, that can tell you something about the full quantum dynamics of your system. So we really need more examples of that because, you know, in this case of PXP, it seemed to work really well, but, um, you know, we don't know general applicability of this. We don't know the limitations of this. It hasn't really been applied to, you know, more diverse models than this. So, you know, that really needs to be, um, I think, explored a bit further. Yeah, even in the classical case, the many-body limit of KM, I think, is quite unclear whether there is something like that or not. Yes, yes. Zlatko, when you say it works well for PXP, I mean, if you scale up the bond dimension to, to really increase the, the classical space space, then it then it doesn't really, right? Or at least I remember a very old talk by Dima where it seemed to, to not work as well. Um, really? I mean, uh, this was several years ago that I, I mean, if you, if instead of doing these bond, the, this, these two dimensional phase spaces, if you just had a huge multi dimensional phase space. Well, so, so the, the problem with that, of course, I mean, we, uh, in this case, you have a classical dynamical system with two variables, so it cannot mm -hmm. even have chaos, right? So the, so the big question is what would happen with this approach if you just started growing your bond dimension? Right. And um, I don't think that that question was really explored very systematically. Um, that's something that actually still needs to be done. Um, this is nice because, you know, you see this periodic orbit and, of course, you know that, you know, that should be the right orbit and so on. And you have some indication here what's going on. So the color is this kind of, uh, you know, what they call quantum leakage, which is, you know, how well this approximation might be expected to work. And you see that that orbit kind of stays away from the region where, you know, that breaks down. So in, in a sense, it's, you trust this periodic orbit, but you're right, it should, this should be investigated, you know, more systematically when you increase the bond dimension. And I don't think that's really been done. We've done some other work where we, you know, still try to, where we try to increase the bond dimension, but, you know, just by one or two, you know, not going to very high bond dimensions so that we can still get, you know, a manageable classical system, which we can integrate semi-analytically, so to say. Okay, okay so, um, I, so I, unfortunately, we're kind of running out of time for questions. I'll, I'll, I saw Anusha raise her hand, so maybe since she's the next speaker, she can ask her question, and then, uh, and then we'll move on. We can defer remaining questions to the breakout room. Um, so, Anusha? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, sorry, I'm, I just wanted to make a comment, and I'll be quick. I was only because you brought it up, Zlatko, the, the mapping and calling this a Fibonacci chain. 
Um, that is, uh, well, so thinking that way, of course, in terms of Hilbert space is fine, but if you thought of the Hamiltonians and interpret them as Fibonacci anion Hamiltonians, they're non-local in the PXP language. So that's just a comment that I think, I think that analogy is misleading for that reason. You don't, you cannot actually simulate Hamiltonians that uh, realize Fibonacci anions or local Hamiltonians in Fibonacci anion space just because of Hilbert space in the center. Absolutely. This is not the Fibonacci chain as, um, you know, as a kind of effective chain for interacting anions that was, that's an integral model. Um, no, I just no, no. call any, it, I put it in quotes. Any, any Hamiltonian of Fibonacci anions, not, nothing to do with integrability, just as the mapping. If you ask what does a Fibonacci anion Hamiltonian, a general one, um, look like in the PX, in the Rydberg atom one, it's, it's a non-local map, so it has to be very fine-tuned for you to see the local on it. Yeah, sure. I mean, I agree with that comment, and yeah, I mean, it's just putting quotes here just because of this fact how the field of space grows, but yeah. Okay, so um, with that, I guess we'll defer further discussions to the breakout rooms, and um, we can move on with uh, Anusha's talk. So Anusha, if you can share your screen, and thanks, Lotko, again.